a federal judge in Florida has struck down this administration's TSA mask mandate. The airplane mask mandate has been struck down by a federal judge, and I think the terms of the striking have to do with the judge believes that Congress should make this rule, not the CDC. Okay, be that as it may, people are up in arms. There's a lot of consternation about this. But first, let's think about what the mandate was. Now, the current mask mandate is that if you're on an airplane, you need to wear a cloth mask. Well, except when you eat or drink something. When you eat or drink something, you don't need to wear it. And that could be a lengthy drink of soda or a bag of pretzels. So in an average airplane flight, and I've been on a bunch of flights recently, you might find that people have the mask down around their chin or off their face entirely for, you know, 45 minutes in coach. And even longer in first class because the meal takes quite a long time. And so you probably get a two-hour window of no mask in first class. When the lights dim, it's an overnight flight or it's an evening flight, then masks come off and no one's enforcing them. Half the time you look around, people's noses are hanging out or they got it as a chin strap. So I think that the actual use of this mask is very, very poor. The actual policy doesn't make a whole lot of sense because how well could it possibly work if you're only doing it for a tiny fraction of the time you're on the airplane? The other thing, the mask that you're allowed to use to sate the requirement is in fact a cloth mask. That's the mask that Turns out it doesn't do that much. It doesn't actually work. In a cluster randomized trial in Bangladesh, the cloth mask arm actually had no further reduction in SARS-CoV-2 versus no mask at all. This is a cluster randomized trial pre-vaccine and pre-natural infection. It doesn't do a whole lot. The current situation. The real question, the real reason to mandate some people mask is to protect other people. But other people can already do something if they so wish to protect themselves. And that's where a high quality N95 mask. You can wear such a mask. So if you're wearing the N95 and you're keeping it on for the whole flight, what's the additional benefit to you to compel the person in the seat next to you to wear a cloth mask, except when they eat or drink, and they could eat or drink for a fairly long time? And to me, the probability that you're gaining much from that is very, very low. So we have to acknowledge that from a public health standpoint, this intervention doesn't make a lot of sense. The next point, we've had vaccinations available for a year. And so, if you want, you could be vaccinated, you could be boosted, depending on how old you are, you could have gotten two boosters, you could have four doses in your arm. We are one year into this, and it also looks like people will eventually get breakthrough. And then the other thing is, the moment you step off the plane and you walk into any city, you'll find that a lot of cities are like Mardi Gras. People are having a fun old time, and they're gathering in large concert halls and venues, maskless, like the gridiron dinner, like all these politicians did. So the real question is, from a broader 30,000-foot view of public health, does this make a lick of sense? And the answer is, it doesn't even make sense. But worse, public health has never really actually tested it. Because airplanes have great ventilation and filtration, does wearing a cloth mask, even in a world where people weren't allowed to wear N90, or people weren't wearing N95s, of course, they're always allowed to, but they may not have had them. In that world, did it actually slow the spread on the airplane? And the truth is, we don't know. We could have answered that question. We could have done a very simple cluster randomized control trial, answer that question. The CDC, there's no rule that says they can't actually generate data. You know, I like, I know they love to do their retrospective, confounded observational studies. There's no rule that says they can't actually do a good job and generate data. We never did that. We never generated that data. So the truth is we don't know. Enter the federal judge. The federal judge comes along and strikes it down and it's going to be appealed and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not a legal expert. And uh, I know people are up in arms. They say, who is this federal judge to unilaterally decide this policy? Well, you know, but who is the CDC to create a policy that's not based in any scientific evidence and continue it year after year without generating that evidence? And I had a thread that was really about public health. And people talk about, you know, what kind of power should public health have? And we can't let the law strip public health of its power. What if there's a future pandemic or catastrophe? And my point of view is simple. My point of view is public health has power, but it also has scientific responsibility. And it neglected the responsibility, so don't be surprised it loses the power. Here's my take. Pre-pandemic, I think you would find I was the most ardent proponent that public health agencies should have vast powers to do all sorts of things in public health emergencies to protect the greater good. And I truly believe that. But then we saw the COVID-19 pandemic, and they did do a lot of things to protect the public good. And I had no problem with that initially. But the problem I had was they didn't actually generate science. You see, you can implement a mask mandate on an airplane, but then you have a scientific obligation to study it, to learn, does it actually help or doesn't it help? You can implement a vaccine mandate, but you have some obligation to see, does it actually reduce spread? And 
If you learn that everyone will get a breakthrough anyway, does your vaccine mandate make sense? Does your vaccine passport for a restaurant make sense? It's separating people who can spread the virus from the people who can spread the virus. It doesn't actually make any sense. When you move to masking two-year-olds, I thought to myself, that's a bold move. It's against the World Health Organization, but surely they're going to run a cluster randomized trial to see if it actually works. But now we're two years later and they didn't run any such study. So public health has failed. They failed on a number of fronts. They have pushed out two people at the FDA in the vaccine products division, and they've greenlit all these boosters. Those boosters may not have come to the U.S. market had it not been for the ousting of those two people, Marion Gruber and Phil Krause. We don't know, but they're on record repeatedly in op-eds saying that they're critical of this policy. That's the White House exerting political pressure and tampering with the FDA. We also see that they are debuting all these interventions from lockdown to mask mandates on planes to two-year-olds. They have some obligation to run studies. They never did. And then the final thing, once they authorized boosters, even for young men at young ages, colleges went ahead and carried carried the baton the last mile. They mandated that. And so you had a situation where a 20-year-old man who had two doses and an Omicron infection was mandated by his school to get a booster or he'd be disenrolled from school, even if it was within, you know, even if he had had the Omicron 30 days before. That to me is an abuse of the public health power. And when public health abuses the power, then I think we have to ask ourselves if they deserve that power. They've lost that, that responsibility. They've abused the power because they never generated scientific evidence. And so what I think should happen is post-COVID, we need a citizen's bill of rights, a bill of rights that says, listen, there's going to be emergencies that come forward. But, you know, we can't let that hospital decide that no one's allowed to visit a loved one unless they have extraordinary evidence that that actually protects other people. By the way, all these hospital visitation policies, they've not studied a single one in a well-done, prospective, randomized fashion. They've just implemented these things, this classic CYA, cover-your-ass kind of uh, medicine implemented by often bureaucrats. They are heartbreaking policies that separate people who are old, frail, sometimes confused, sometimes delirious from loved ones. And they do that because they're saying that slow spread. Do they have evidence that it's slow spread? We're going to publish a paper on this topic very shortly. We're going to publish a paper. We shall learn. Do they have evidence? Did they actually generate evidence? But I think you know the answer. They, they probably didn't do that much. They failed. They're abusing these powers. They're not generating evidence. And so then they're surprised that you know, some judge is going to strip them of some of those powers. Don't be surprised. That's what happens. That's what happens when you do this. So I think overall, the mandate, uh, I see people are very upset that the mask mandates have fallen on airplanes. They shouldn't be that upset because the reality is it probably wasn't doing that much to have somebody wear a mask that doesn't work for part of the time on the flight, uh, except when they eat or drink. Um, I saw somebody say, I think this was Jerome Adams, the former Surgeon General. He said that that mask mandate was also protecting the family that's taking their four-year-old child who has cancer, is getting chemotherapy on a public bus. And now that child's on the public bus and the person next to them could be coughing COVID all over the child. I thought to myself, that's a horrible, you know, horrible hypothetical scenario. But think about it this way. If that person next to this child on the bus had a cloth mask on and the family felt like that was adequate protection for their child who's undergoing chemotherapy, I would say that... That's a false sense of security. You don't need, you shouldn't be on that bus. We should be providing a system where this poor child and this poor vulnerable person who's going to get chemotherapy should not be on that bus. And making some of the passengers wear a flimsy cloth mask that doesn't work in a poorly ventilated bus is a false sense of security. And maybe now it's not great, but at least it's all obvious to everyone that there is no security on that bus. And this person should be in a private transportation vehicle with the windows down, et cetera, et cetera. We need to work on that. And there are a number of ways in which we can do that in, in a clinical situation, even for patients who are have uh, limited resources. There are such things. Um, but my point is that that anecdote, um, although vivid, is uh, not really representative. The real question is, are these policies slowing spread broadly? And you can tell a story, but public health and science isn't a series of anecdotes. It's evidence, and you have to generate evidence. Do these policies actually slow spread? I really worry that this Jerome Adams story, that kid may be more vulnerable for being on the bus thinking that flimsy cloth mask is protecting the kid, and, the, and they may be misled by that. So my overall thoughts here <clears throat> are, you know, do I know the perfect world in which judges should be adjudicating this? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that public health has lost some of their 
their credibility. They've lost their credibility by pushing policies that were clearly contradicted by common sense and not generating evidence while they pushed those policies. You know, if they pushed those policies and run the trials and found they worked or didn't work, I would be happy. They pushed the policies and they keep pushing them year after year and they never generated the evidence. And that is inexcusable. And this mandate has fallen, but very likely this mandate didn't do that much. And also, the truth is, the average person in the street we don't know what they think, but I suspect they're probably pretty happy that they don't have this mandate. The person who wants to can continue to wear whatever mask they want on this flight, or they can continue to seek other com more comfortable modes of, of transportation. But the speed with which the airlines drop the mandate and sort of the cries of jubilation that have already been sort of reported suggest that a lot of people don't like this policy. And they can see through a policy where you pull the mask down and you eat a bag of pretzels as slow as humanly possible. They can see through that policy that it just don't make sense. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.